so that concludes Daniel chapter 7 for now. And uh, as a recap, Daniel chapter 7 has a reference to the three and a half times. He calls it times, times, and the dividing of a time, and a reference to four beasts. Again, the repetition of the incidents of four kingdoms. And the fourth beast being terrible and having ten horns, a reference to what Jesus called the beast with seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns on each head, and the name blasphemy on each crown. The one that Abdul Baha has explained prolifically, and thankfully, I might add. So, now there's another prophecy, another time prophecy in Daniel chapter 12. There's actually three time prophecies in that chapter. It's a 13 verse chapter, one of his uh, shorter chapters, maybe the shortest, but it has, it is uh, packed full. It is packed full of time prophecies, and uh, it's short enough that I can read the whole chapter uh, without taking up much time. And it begins, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as was never seen since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. Now, first of all, let's talk about this first verse. Uh, Here is introduced Michael. And he's not referred to again until the book of Revelation. So from Daniel to Revelation, Michael is mentioned twice. Michael is not a name. Michael is a title. If you notice, there are a lot of Jewish words, Jewish names, that end in the letters E-L, that end in L. Michael, Ezekiel, Joel, Carmel. L is the Hebrew word for God. So Michael is a title because it includes the name of God. And Michael means is actually Michael, and it means he who looks like God. So this is a prophecy of God himself. And throughout the Old Testament, there are references to God himself, uh, even in the New Testament and Revelation, that God himself will walk among them, and they shall be his people, and he shall be their God. And it says that this time Michael shall stand up. Now, Michael will stand up for the downtrodden, for those who've been oppressed and mistreated, the victims of injustice. Uh, Pretty much anybody who's not a part of the government uh, has been a victim of the government, the governments of the world, somewhere today. So Michael, we'll call him Michael, uh, will stand up for those downtrodden, oppressed souls and revive them. And he's referred to as the Great Prince. Now remember, earlier in Daniel, there was reference to the Messiah, the Prince. And so the Great Prince is higher than the Prince. And is another reference to the Father, which standeth for the children of thy people. And these are Jewish prophecies. So the children of Israel, many, many generations later. And it says, And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. At that time thy people shall be delivered. Now, we know that Israel has returned, so thy people have been delivered. So Michael has to have already stood up the downtrodden, because people cannot, can neither thwart the will of God, nor can they carry out their own will without God's assistance, or do what's expected of them, or what's been foretold of them, uh, on their own, without God's assistance. So, by the very existence of Israel, Michael has already stood up, and he has come and walked among us. And I'll continue with uh, Daniel 12, verse 2. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now, as an aside here, I think if you had a choice of what you wanted to wake up to, uh, and your choice was either everlasting life or shame and everlasting contempt, I'm going to go with, I hope, you know, you would say, I want to awake to everlasting life. How do I do that? And I'm pretty sure it's not by asserting anything of your own when you stand in the presence of God. There's a verse of Baha'u'llah where he says, talks about the greatness of this day, and he says, Great indeed is is this day. No sooner, however, the day star of truth manifested himself in the heaven of God's irrevocable will than all, except those whom God was pleased to guide, were found dumbfounded and heedless. So look closely. It says, Those whom God was pleased to guide. So if you let God guide you, it very may well be that God will be pleased. 
so we can please God by letting him guide us. And we let God guide us by, what, doing what we think is right or asserting our own interpretation? No. By relying on God, by being detached from the things of this world, by heeding the verses of Baha'u'llah and letting them influence your soul to such an extent that you're transformed and you become a new creation. Now, that is something I cannot do for you and you cannot do for me. I have trouble doing it for myself. You might have a better luck with it um, for yourself. So, verse 3. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as stars forever and ever. So here I kind of got ahead of myself asking how can we do this. Uh, they that be wise will shine as the brightness of the firmament, and turning people to righteousness, turning many to righteousness, will be like stars shining forever and ever. Verse 4, But thou, O Daniel, shut off the words, and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Now this uh, verse has been given a lot of currency in recent times. Uh, it's a command of God to Daniel that the words, the book will be sealed. And in the book of Revelation, there is a prophecy of uh, the Lamb who will unseal the book the book of the seven seals. So again, Daniel describes the book. Jesus is a little bit more descriptive in Revelation as he is with the beast with the seven heads and ten horns. He refers to the book with the seven seals. And who can open the book? Who is found worthy to open the book? And no man is found worthy to open the book. But the lamb can open the book. The lamb, of course, is a symbol for a sacrifice. And the Bob, the promised Christ, the Messiah, the Kayam, was sacrificed, uh, just like Jesus suspended in the air, and murdered by a brutal government. Uh, the rest of the verse says, uh, even to the time of the end. Now, it doesn't say the end of the world. It just says the time of the end. Now, I know a lot of uh, scholars and people speaking to these issues, um, doomsayers, like to talk about the end of the world, and everything will be blown up except them. And they know who's going to be saved. It's a little preposterous. But here is a reference to the time of the end, not the end of the world. So all these things can be looked at uh, in context of all their names. Even to the time of the end, the book shall be sealed, meaning that the prophecies will not be able to be uh, uncovered by mortals. And the time of the end, it says, many shall run to and fro. And it's, it's a, this is a description uh, in ancient terms to describe what we take for granted, massive transmigration, travel in automobiles and trains and planes and that sort of thing, rockets. Many shall run to and fro is a very, I won't say graphic description, but it's a very easy description. And it says, and knowledge shall be increased. So again, we have seen since the coming of the Bab, since the declaration of the Bab and the coming of Baha'u'llah, we have seen an exponential increase in human capacity for knowledge and scientific development. So this one little prophecy has, very simply stated, uh, has been clearly fulfilled. And verse 5 goes on to say, Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two, the one on this side of the bank of the river, and the other on that side of the bank of the river. So there's two uh, beings he sees, two angels, two spiritual souls, and the one said to the man clothed in linen. Now here it's introduced, the man clothed in linen. In the book of Revelation, uh, Abdu'l-Baha explains where Jesus says, and I will send my two witnesses clothed in sackcloth. So these two witnesses that will follow Jesus and appear before Michael are not the promised one because they're wearing sackcloth, old remnant. But linen, of course, is new. And this is how Abdu'l-Baha explains it. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? Now here again is another reference to the end. The end of these wonders. Not the explosion of the planet and the death of everybody and all that sort of thing. All that sort of uh, pointless imagery. Which still may very well happen. But um, it's not referred to only as the end of the world and the destruction of everybody. It's referred to the end of these wonders. And wonders... You know, people in bondage is not really a wonder. But um, it's an interesting uh, descriptor for the sufferings of people. 
Verse 7 says, And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river. Now here, remember the, the waters uh, are, is the, the river of God, the river of the word of God. And he's standing on the river. So there's one on the river and there's two standing beside him. Two, both in linen, like the Bob and abdul Baha. And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time, times, and an half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. So here again, this is the three and a half times, the 1260-year prophecy of uh, the religion of Muhammad, the dispensation of Muhammad, and the reference to the overthrow of Islam by the beast. And it says, And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. So be the coming of a new day. And the, the Jews will be scattered across the earth and brought back. And verse 8 says, And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? So thankfully, Daniel, you know, in case you don't understand all this, which we don't, uh, even Daniel is saying, thankfully for us, for our benefit, um, asking for another explanation. Verse 9 says, And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Now here is interesting, because in, in this one short chapter, here's the second time prophecy, one thousand two hundred and ninety days. Now this one, if we take lunar years, one thousand two hundred and ninety lunar years from before the Hegira, ten years before the Hegira, in six twelve AD, and add twelve hundred and ninety lunar years to it, that resolves in eighteen sixty three. And here we're getting beyond the 1844 um, Declaration of the Bab, birth of Abdul Baha, and getting this is the prophecy of Baha'u'llah's declaration. And in verse 12, right after that, it said, Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. And the last verse says, But go thou thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest, and stand in thy holy lot at the end of the days. So Daniel is promised that he will stand up, he will stand too. Not stand up, but he will stand. Uh, so when Baha'u'llah comes, Daniel will be there somewhere. That's interesting. We need to find it. Back to verse 12, it says, Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. Now this one I've had a little difficulty laying out completely. It might... Because from the Hajira, 622, and solar years, 622 and 1355, 1335, resolves at 1957, which was the time of the passing of Shoghi Effendi. And it wasn't until 1963, some six years later, that the House of Justice was, uh, the first House of Justice was elected. So, we're still working on this one. But it seems to resolve in a series, with a series of events. And Abdu'l-Baha has promised that this reference means that a hundred years after the declaration of Baha'u'llah. Now, a hundred lunar years after the declaration of Baha'u'llah, there is also a prophecy that Shoghir Effendi refers to in God Passes By, page 151. The hundred lunar years was fulfilled. A hundred lunar years from 1863, of course, is not 1963, it's 1960. So all these are still being researched, even as we speak. Now, the next one we're going to talk about is uh, another Christian prophecy. Well, actually, it's the prophecy of Islam. Now, I want to jump back to a time prophecy that resolves long before 1260 days, 1844 prophecies. It's what many refer to as the mark of the beast. And it's the type of time prophecy that the vast majority of people do not even realize that it's a time prophecy basically because they don't want to see it as a time prophecy because it's so obvious that it's a time prophecy that it, and that it's been resolved long before 
modern day Christianity has come, that it would just throw into whack all their calculations about when Christ is going to return, which of course is not today, and it's not tomorrow, and it's not anytime soon, and it could be, who knows, forever before he finally does, or before they deign to recognize that he has returned. And it's Revelation chapter 13. So let's get started. Now, Revelation 13 is an 18 verse chapter. Again, not very long. I'll try not to elongate it too much for you. But it begins with John saying, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Now, by any stretch of the imagination, this is a dangerous beast, one that will blaspheme against the cause of God. And we know from Abdu'l-Baha that the beast is the Umayyad dynasty and all those who continued after them who overthrew Islam. And the reason why I mention that is because this chapter gets quite descriptive about the beast. Verse 2 says, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority. Now the description of the beast is that he's a leopard, bear, lion. These are carnivores. Now, of course, Israel is described as a mighty lion, but this is a mixture of leopard, bear, and lion, and it's the dragon that gives him his power. Now, in this chapter, the dragon is not defined, but in uh, chapter 20 and chapter 12, the dragon is defined as Satan, as the devil, and Satan. So, the dragon, so Satan gives the beast its power. So, Satan gave Muaviyah and the Umayyads their power, and those that overthrew Islam drew their power from Satan, according to Jesus in the book of Revelation. Verse 3 says, And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Now, to explain this verse, we need to know a little bit about the course of Islam, the history of Islam after the passing of Muhammad. As I may have mentioned, As Muhammad lay on his deathbed, he called out for a pen. At this point, Muhammad had twice pointed to Ali and said, If you turn to Ali, you turn to Muhammad. And he announced to the entire congregation, the, the, the entire following, the entire body of his followers, that Ali was his successor. And here is Muhammad on his deathbed, apparently, and everyone's lining up to see who's going to take control and what's going to happen when he's gone, because with the prophet there, you can't really openly rebel against him. But once he's gone, that's a different story. So here's Muhammad calling out for a pen. And Omar jumps up and intervenes and blasphemes and denies that the prophet is of sound mind and says, the book of God sufficeth. We don't need anything more. We have the Quran. And so obviously, if it was God's will that Muhammad should put in writing who his successor was, it would have happened. Obviously, since it didn't happen, since it didn't happen, when Muhammad called out for a pen, it wasn't to leave a will, but to expose a traitor, which is exactly what happened when Omar stood up and blasphemed against the prophet and tried desperately to take over and rejected Ali as the true successor of Muhammad and said, we must vote as is our tradition. Now, there's no religious tradition to support the notion that voting among the followers for the successor is legitimate, appropriate, ever been done before. There's no religious precedent or authority for that, that bald assertion. And still, they voted. And Omar was frustrated. He couldn't get enough support. And so Abu Bakr was declared the first caliph. Caliph means successor. Uh, which in this sense, in this case, he's not the successor. He's the one handpicked by a selfish group of followers who had rejected, who had rebelled against the prophet. So the title caliph, the reason why I say this, because in the first verse it says, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. So all the heads that have the title caliph 
are blaspheming against the Prophet because the Prophet never said, elect among yourselves. He said, turn to Ali. And they didn't turn to Ali. They rebelled, they rejected, and they chose instead to follow the beast. And of course, the dragon gave them power. Satan gave them power. And they're all Satan worshippers. Again, this is very dangerous beast. Now it says, I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, which is an interesting image. Now, as I mentioned, uh, Omar procured elections uh, after Abu Bakr was elected. After a short period of time, he died suddenly. Uh, Omar, and then on his deathbed, uh, allegedly says, points to Omar and says, you should give your support to Omar. And so Omar finally gets elected. The second caliph uh, died a few years later under suspicious circumstances. Uthman was the third caliph, was murdered. And finally, Ali was elected the fourth caliph. So this is their last chance to, to rectify things and return the Muslim camp to unity. But at that time, they had spread Islam by the sword. Uh, there were a lot of military campaigns. Muawiyah was in open rebellion against Ali, and Ali was planning to bring Muawiyah into custody and to remove him from power. It never happened. What happened instead was that there were three Muslims who were so disturbed by the disunity among the Muslim community that they resolved that the only way to bring the unity back would be to murder all the leaders. And there were three leaders that they singled out. One was Ali, another was Muawiyah, and the third one was Amru, someone named Amru. Now, they went to murder Amru. They weren't the best of assassins. Uh, they murdered the guy next to Amru. Now, of course, they succeeded in murdering Ali. Wouldn't you know? Uh, now, as far as Muawiyah is concerned, Muawiyah was struck in the head with a sword and survived. So here in verse 3 of Revelation 13, it says, And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death. Now, Muawiyah is the one who will, who will overthrow Islam completely after the death of Ali, after the murder of Ali. And his heads, as it were, was wounded to death. Everyone thought he was dead, and then he recovered. And his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And so everybody said, oh, this is from God, and it was not from God. And verse 4 says, and they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So I mentioned previously about Satan worshippers. It says here in verse 4, and I'm, I'm not making this up, I was just jumping ahead. And they worshipped the dragon. Now the dragon in chapter 20 says the dragon is the devil, is Satan. So it says, and they worshipped Satan, is what this is saying. And Satan gave power to Moavia. And they worshipped Moavia. Because they were afraid to do anything against him. And verse 5 goes on to say, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And here again, in, verse, in chapter 11, the two witnesses prophesy for 1,260 days, and the beast is given power for forty and two months. So the Messiah is given a 70-week prophecy, the two witnesses 1,260 days, so weeks and days are reserved for the good guys, but months are given to the beast. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Now, Moabia was very brutal and subversive and deceitful. Hassan was the oldest son of Ali and was promised that... Uh, now, see, what happened was Moabia overthrew and declared himself the caliph and said, we don't need elections anymore. And I'm stunned and staggered that no one ever blinks at this alteration of what was an essential claim of Omar, that we have to have elections, and we can't follow, and Omar denied that they should follow the lineage of the prophet. And here comes Moavia saying, well, we don't need elections anymore, and they're going to follow, uh, he's going to set up a dynasty, that his progeny, his lineage is, you know, he claims to be superior to the lineage of the prophet. I cannot think of a greater blasphemy than, than this sort of thing that goes largely unnoticed by any religious scholar or historian. 
verse 7 goes, And it be, was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Now, the Abdu'l-Bahá refers to the beast as, as the Umayyad dynasty, having the seven heads and the ten horns, uh, the seven dominions, the seven countries that they ruled over, and the ten leaders, uh, the ten kings, the ten successors of Muawiya, which, uh, although there was like 14, there were several of them that had the same name. So among them, they only had ten names. And Abdu'l-Bahá has explained that. Okay, verse 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So pretty much everybody in Islam is going to follow these, these, the beast. If any man have an ear, let him hear. Now it doesn't say all those people that have ears. It says if any man, let him hear. If any man have an ear, let him hear. Not very many people refer to it in that verse. Most people don't have an ear, and they're not listening. Verse 10 begins, And he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So it's going to be a very brutal campaign for these 42 months, these 1260 years. Verse 11, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. This is the son of Moabia. And he exerciseth all power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. A, a second reference to this assassination attempt on Moabia that, that almost succeeded. Verse 13, And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and caused that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Now here is the first mention of the so-called mark of the beast. Now the words mark of the beast are not to be found. But it mentions a mark that the beast makes on their right hand or their foreheads. Now, this is an interesting image. Interesting because there are different ways that it could be fulfilled because it says in their right hand or their foreheads. Now, people wear a headdress, could wear a certain headdress, and that could be the mark. But it doesn't say what the mark is. Now, everybody, many Christian scholars are happy to announce that the mark of the beast is the number 666. Let's see if the Bible says what they say it is. And here's a hint. It doesn't. Verse 17 says, And that no man might buy or sell, save that he had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Now here is, you, you can say the mark of the beast is mentioned, because uh, grammatically it says the mark, comma, or the name of the beast. So, but the, the name of the beast now could refer to the followers, could refer to the, his progeny, his descendants. But again, the mark is not explained as to what it is. If they had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. So grammatically, the mark of the beast is not mentioned. The name of the beast is, and the number of his name is. But the mark is just referring to verse 16, which says that he causes the mark to be made in the right hand or their foreheads. So there, uh, we're almost at the end. But the mention of the mark has nothing to do with 666, or 603 score and 6. Verse 18 begins, Here is wisdom, which again is like verse 9 that says, If any man have an ear, let him hear. Here is wisdom. It does not mean do whatever you want, or say whatever you want, or mix things up if you like. It says, Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding. Again, I don't know who that person is. He's the same person in verse 9. If any man have an ear, let him hear. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. Could anything be clearer? It's the number of the beast. 
for it is the number of a man. And his number is 603 score and 6. Now, where does it say that the mark of the beast is the number of the beast? It doesn't say it anywhere. But many Christian scholars will make this leap of faith that the, the mark must be the number, because they say so. And they surely know more about God. They sure know more about the Bible than God himself. Who could challenge their authority? So again, let's read it again. Here is wisdom. Let him that under, hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. So this is a time prophecy. What do we count? What do we count, if not our years? What do we keep track of day after day, year after year, if not our age? So the obvious interpretation of this verse is that it is a time prophecy that in the year 666 AD, the beast will overthrow the religion of the prophet Muhammad, the devil shall be worshipped instead, and all kind of violent blasphemies will be carried out in the name of God. That's the obvious interpretation without requiring any sort of cross-pollinization uh, of the mark of the beast with the number of the beast. And I have never heard any Christian scholar talk about the number of the beast. Never. Only the mark. But of course, these are the ones you know, that, that get on TV and um, you know, spout about how they know everything. And they're still waiting for uh, some European king to kill three other kings and, and brand everybody in the forehead or their hand with 666. And just overlooking the obvious. Because in the year 666, Let's go back. Ali was murdered in 661. We should have a drum roll for this. By the time his deadly wound was healed, his first command, uh, when he consolidated power in the Islamic camp, was to sack Medina, to desecrate Mecca, and to remove the capital to Damascus. So Mecca and Medina are sacked and desecrated, these holy places, and Muawiyah, who was in Syria, to begin with, moves the capital to where he is, which is Damascus. And these dastardly acts were conducted by the year 666 AD. So if we, without any effort, we can find historical proof that when Jesus says, I will send my two witnesses, by the year 666 AD, he had two, Muhammad and Ali had appeared and their religion had been overthrown, just exactly as it's foretold in chapter 13 of the book of Revelation. And I challenge anyone to come up with an interpretation that can refute this.